for is company. Now and again in the holidays, everybody would get sick of playing forts or Red Indians or football. And when this happened, the gang would sit on Gormy's front porch in bags and bags until everybody grew absolutely sick of it. Then gradually, bit by bit, they would begin to pick on each other and make each other wild. Gormy used to get the wildest, so Smitty would begin by annoying him. To make him wild, Smitty just had to call him Wildy O'Gorman, and then start to spell it out. W-I-L-D-Y. Wildy O'Gorman. Wildy, Wildy, Wildy O'Gorman. Horsey and Bryn would join in with the Wildy, Wildy, W-I-L-D-Y, Wildy O'Gorman. And it wouldn't matter how friendly they all were before they started, because Gormy would soon get really mad. And when he was mad, he looked real fierce. He would screw up his eyes and hiss through his teeth, which he kept closed all the time. But they didn't get Gormy wild too often, because it was too dangerous. He was such a good shot with a brick. Once or twice when he was spitting or foaming at the mouth, he hit Smitty with a stone and made Smitty mad. And Smitty went straight for him and gave him a jolly good hiding. And that was usually the end of it, as Gormy just tore inside his place howling. Sometimes, when Gormy was much younger, Smitty, who was also much younger then, would run after him and give him a big push, and that would send Gormy sprawling on his face. As he climbed to his feet and ran off again, still bawling, Smitty would give him another big push, and over he'd go once more, grazing his legs and losing his breath. But that was a long time ago, and when Gormy was about four, and Smitty was about five. By the time they were both over six, they were too friendly for Smitty to do anything like that anymore. When they made Horsey wild, it wasn't much good, because he just went straight home, though they had a bit of fun for a while trying to stop him from getting home. It wasn't much use teasing Bryn either, because he was Smitty's younger brother, and he would only bawl his eyes out and tear home and tell on Smitty, and then Smitty would get it in the neck. It wasn't much good trying to tease Smitty, it just wouldn't work. He was the biggest and the best fighter. The best fun of all came when the gang teased the boy Doan from another street. They thought that was really good fun, because Doan was a half silly sort of boy, and always doing stupid sort of things. One day he fell down the bank on his head, and his horse had said, no one with any sense would do such a thing like that. Everybody played on the bank all the time and was very steep in parts, but nobody was silly enough to fall on his head. Though they sometimes slipped down on their seats, and went hopping and holding their sore behinds and crying, oh, oh, oh. And if they ripped their trousers, they probably would have to cry ooh, ooh, ooh again when they arrived home. Well, at least Horsey would, because his mother was pretty strict on him and gave him a hiding about three times a week, at least. Gormy ripped his pants, they would just have to stay ripped for a week until the next change. He only had two pairs of trousers. Well anyway, Doan was a bit silly. Horsey wasn't sure whether he was better or worse after he landed on his head, but either way he was still goofy. The gang called him Dopey Davis, because his second name was Davis. Dopey Dopey Davis, they would cry. He would swear and swear so much that you could never hear any other sort of words at all. In the middle of all his swearing, he would get stuck on one word and say that over and over again. At the same time, he'd throw bricks all over the place. To keep him from coming too close, Smitty would land a brick on his legs now and again. Smitty was a really good shot. Once or twice, Dopey became quite dangerous came right up towards Smitty and the others with his swearing and his rocks. When this happened, they just let him have it with a whole lot of bricks together and that sent him off, screaming mad, full speed for home. But the gang was soon sick of teasing him. It wasn't the sort of thing that they could be bothered wasting much time on. Besides, his mother would come out and tell them off. She might even go and tell their mothers and they would all get hidings when their dads came home. This happened once when Bryn met a real butte Shanghai like the one he had heard about at Sunday school. Old Miss Elmtree told them the story of David killing Goliath with a sling, but she wouldn't tell Bryn how David made his sling, though he asked every Sunday for about six weeks after the story, until she finally got mad and sent him outside. After that, just to show her, after that, just to show her, Bryn wagged the next couple of Sundays and spent his penny on licorice men instead of the real black men of Africa. But even though he kept asking her, Bryn didn't really care whether she told him or not, because he had made a sling as soon as he'd heard the story for the first time. It was sort of a sling and a catapult. A piece of string was tied onto a peg, and the other end of the string was tied to a big round piece of rubber cut out of a square tube he'd borrowed from Gormy, who had found it at the back of the Delaney's garage one day when the door was left open. 
On the other end of this piece of rubber, he joined a small leather pouch with two pieces of string. Holding the peg with one hand and the pouch in the other, he would pull back the pouch until the rubber band was stretched right out and then hold the hand with the peg high in the air. He'd throw this down and forward at the same time as he let the pouch go. This would throw anything he had in the pouch out at a tremendous speed. He could send a brick about three lampposts away with a really hard shot. Most of the time he just used little round green berries off the karaka tree. There was a karaka tree growing down on the top of the bank of the street. Bryn didn't mind firing it at the people because he knew it must be different from David's sling. He was not likely to kill anybody. And anyway, he reckoned he was too good a shot to hit anybody in a dangerous place. Well, one day he was sitting up on top of the bank while Margaret Davis, Doan's older sister, was playing marbles down in the street with Nancy Brown. Margaret was standing up straight over a round ring marked in clay on the footpath and playing bullseye, a sissy game of marbles. Unseen and unheard above them, about two cricket pitches away, Bryn slowly drew tight the leather of his sling, paused for a moment, then zing, away went the cracker berry, and ouch, it hit right on Margaret's lip, a real beaut. Down the bank scrambled Bryn and hurried over to look at the kill. By this time, Margaret had recovered from the first shock and was bawling her eyes out, running for home. Bryn quickly overtook her. Give us a look, he said, and grabbed Marg by the arm. Marg tugged away and ran on, sobbing and screaming and panting, but Bryn saw that her lip was all swollen up, big and funny looking. Just for a moment, he felt as if he'd been a bit stupid. Uh, shrug your shoulders, slightly sick sort of feeling. But he couldn't worry about that for long, because he could see that he would soon be in trouble if he didn't look out. He ran quickly back along the road, climbed the bank, and hid in the trees, burying himself well down in the long grass. A little later, along came Mrs. Davis, looking really mad and dragging Marg after her. She went straight along the path to Bryn's gate and marched quickly round the side. As soon as she disappeared out of sight, Bryn climbed over the O'Gorman's fence, tore round the back of their place. Then he climbed up on the O'Gorman's lavatory and looked over the roof with his head just under the thing on top of the lav that held the water. From there, he could see over into his own backyard without being seen. Mrs. Davis was standing with Marg at the back door and talking at the top of her voice to Bryn's mother, and his mother was saying, Yes, yes, is that so? But Brian isn't like that, surely? No, not really. Well, I wouldn't have believed it. When Mrs. Davis had gone, Bryn hopped over into his own backyard and asked his ma what Mrs. Davis had wanted, just as if he didn't know anything about it. You know very well what she wanted, young man. Wait until your father get home tonight, and you'll find out, she said. Bryn found out all right, because his father gave him a real hiding, took the Shanghai off him. Afterwards, Bryn told Smitty and Gormie and Horsey about it, and they decided they definitely wouldn't let Doan come into their fort after that. They couldn't have anybody in the fort with that sort of a mother. But Doan kept asking them if he could come up. No, your mother's spoiled it for you, said Smitty. Besides, your sister's a big wimp. But as Gormie said, we don't want him stinking out the fort. Things are okay as they is. Doan wasn't the only one who wanted to be in the fort. Curly used to want to come up there too, mainly so he could smoke. He was too scared to smoke in his own fort unless his mother was out, but he didn't mind taking the risk in Smitty's fort. Smitty got a bit of wild, because he knew that he'd get the blame if they were caught. After the time Mrs. Smith had leant out the window when they were all smoking like Billy-O, the gang had decided they'd better not take any more risks, and they knocked off smoking for a while. But Curly didn't seem to care how dangerous it was and kept on asking if he could come up and have a smoke. So Gormy thought that it was just about time that they fixed him for good. So this is what they did. They all went down to the tram stop and collected a whole lot of cigarette butts and put these in a tin. While they were doing this, Bryn put some nails on the tram lines, and a couple of trams that went by flattened them out properly. Bryn flattened a nail or two out every time he went down to the shops. When the nails were all flattened out, they were just like big spears he'd seen a Zulu carrying at the pitchers once. The head of the nail was a flat blade in the spear, and in his bedroom at home he'd made two tribes of Zulus out of plasticine, and he needed quite a few more of these spears before he could begin a battle between them. When the gang were back at the fort, they took all the tobacco out of the cigarette butts and put it in a good new tobacco tin, so that the tin was half full. Then Gormy went round to the trees and looked around to see if Curly was in sight. Yes, he was. He was down the street, playing on his scooter with a couple of girls. So Gormy took the tin and crept out again. 
As soon as he saw Curly go down the far end of the street and out of sight, Gormy ran down outside Curly's place and left the tin close in front of Curly's gate, just as if it had been dropped there by one of carpenters working on the house next door. When this was done, the gang hid in the streets and watched. Along came Curly on a scooter. He stopped at the tin, picked it up, opened it, looked around to see that nobody was watching, then tore hard round the back of his own place. I wonder if he'll smoke it, said Horsey. Of course he will, said Smitty. He smokes like a chimney every time he can. His mother's out today, so he's probably smoking it right now in his fort. Ugh, said Bryn. Fancy smoking a lot of butts and bits of cigarettes that have been in other people's mouths and lying on the street. Oh, he won't know that. It'll serve him right for smoking so much, said Gormy. Dirty tricks for dirty people, said Horsey. So the gang left the trees and wandered round the back of Gormy's place, hopped over Smitty's fence and went into the fort. There was just room for the four of them inside, and no more. What a beaut, said Smitty, and all the others began to laugh and laugh and laugh. Horsey winked at Bryn, and Bryn winked at Gormy, and Gormy winked at Smitty. Then they all nodded and wagged their heads wisely from side to side. They knew. But Doan still kept wanting to be in the fort. One day he came up to Bryn in the street, took him to one side and said, I've got a secret. Oh, scram, said Bryn. True, I have. Scram. It's about some money. What money? Some money me uncle gave me. I'll spend it on goodies and cigarettes if you let me come up in the fort. So Bryn ran off up the hill to the fort and told Smitty and the others. They said that Doan was just a big liar, but that if he reckoned he had some money, he could go and spend it down at the dairy, and they would wait in the fort till he arrived back with the cakes and goodies. They told Bryn to go and help Doan carry back the feed. So off ran Bryn and walked down to the shops with Doan. The doorbell rang, said Doan. And I went to the door, and there was my Uncle Wally, and he said, Here's a quid. I heard it was your birthday, my Uncle Wally says. By this time they reached the dairy, and in they went, Doan waving the quid note in his hand. The lady behind the counter was Mrs. James. She'd been there for years and years, knew Bryn's mother and Doan's mother and everybody else. I want ten bottles of ginger beer, five cakes of chocolate, five packets of cigarettes, said Doan, waving the quid. Is that so? said Mrs. James. All right, then give me your money. Doan handed across the note. No sooner had he done this than Mrs. James turned around and disappeared out the back of the shop. Where's she gone? said Bryn. I don't know, said Doan, with a scared look on his face. They both stood there for a moment, looked at each other awkwardly. You did get that money from your Uncle Wally, didn't you? said Bryn. Of course I did, said Doan, going red. They stood there for a little while more. And then Bryn said, I'll wait outside for you. No good both of us waiting in here. And he went out. A few minutes later, out came Doan. Where's the food and stuff, said Bryn. Oh, she wouldn't give it to me, said Doan, with his mouth turned down and tears starting to come up over his eyelids. Why not? She just told me to go home. She said that she'd rung up Mum and that she was waiting for me at home. Oh, gee, said Bryn. And they both walked quietly up the road not saying anything until they reached Doan Street. Well, bye, said Bryn, and they tore off home through Gormy's place and over the fence into the fort, while Doan slowly opened his own gate and the big tears in his eyes went inside to see his mother. Once in the fort, Bryn told the others what had happened. I reckon he's pinched it, said Gormy. What did Mrs. James ring up his mother for, said Horsey. To find out if he did get it from his Uncle Wally, I suppose, said Smitty. He's pinched it all right. Bit of a cow, though, said Gormy. I could go for a bottle of ginger beer myself.